I remember my geography teacher at the time barking, saying, Bugwa, we need you in debate club. She was also, she also doubled up as the head of debate. And I didn't think much of it. I just figured that's something that I need to tick. And say so I attended drama club or debate club, and that's fine. So I didn't make anything of it. And then everyone was given a topic to go home and research and see whether you'll be for or against. I think it was something around corporal punishment. I, I don't even remember. It's hazy. And to just tell you how not serious I was about it, I reached out to my older brother. He's an intellect, always has been. He's like, a, he's like Wikipedia, basically. And I said, I need some talking points. Just write them for me. I'll just regurgitate them. And he did. And I went in. And when we did the rehearsal, people were like, oh, OK. Your voice is powerful. I guess you could just go and debate for us. I said, I will. And so we did an inter-house debate, and I won Best Speaker, and then did inter-school debate in Mombasa, where I come from, and won Best Speaker. And that was so odd for me, because just years ago, I was called Frog Voice. That was my nickname. I know it's pretty harsh, but it's because I've always had this sort of like baritone, hoarse voice. And so the kids used to call me Frog Voice. And so I was very insecure about it, and suddenly, I'm 14 years old, and I'm winning Best Debater in Mombasa. And that's the first time I said, huh, OK, maybe there is something to my voice. Interesting. And I think that moment was pivotal for me because it allowed me to just be at peace with how I sounded. I carried that through my teens and all the way through my 20s. And then I eventually landed the gig of being a news anchor, which again, you could never have predicted for me. And it's with that that something began to change, because here I was being faced with issues that I was broadcasting every night. You know, social issues, political issues. And from radio to TV, I got into the media, and then suddenly something shifted. It wasn't just about having a good voice, or having a voice for TV or for radio. It was about the fact that now my voice was a source of credibility. If people wanted to know the truth, I was part of a community that was providing that truth. And so suddenly, there was a sense of responsibility with this voice that I had. And I was leaning into that, but something shifted when in 2013, while I was at Citizen TV, we ran a feature called Periods of Shame. Periods of Shame showed the story of two girls who were using chicken feathers, goat hide, soil, in place of sanitary products. It showed the deep scope of period poverty in Kenya. And that triggered something in me. It really did, because I brought that feature onto a talk show that I used to host. And then Kenyans were also deeply outraged online. They were saying, how is it 2013, and girls are being forced to use chicken feathers, goat hide? because they don't have access to sanitary pads and sanitary products. And that's when something shifted, and I say to my boss at the time, I want to do something. Can we do something as a station? Um, she said, sure, go ahead, what do you have in mind? And I came up with the name Inua Dada, which is Uplift a Sister. And the whole idea was it was going to be part symbolic, which is give sanitary products to the girls who don't have it, but also push for policy change and increase a budgetary allocation uh, with the government. And that's when I think my journey from discovering that I had a gift with my voice to really being able to utilize my voice for something deeper really happened. And so I formed the Nuadada Foundation in 2014. And it basically, at the time, was intervention around helping girls access sanitary products while also trying to do research, monitoring, and evaluation, and media and advocacy. Continues to, to evolve a little bit. And Here's a snapshot of some of the work we've done over the years. Um, and I really started to say that this feels right. It feels right to be able to stand for something, to speak on behalf of those who can't. And that's when I started to evolve into what I guess people label an advocate. And I always say I really am an advocate misfit because I don't know half the abbreviations that people use, the acronyms. All I know is that I was triggered and I wanted to do something about it. Um, there's a look at some of the numbers. Over the last few years, we've impacted at least upwards of 10,000, 12,000 girls and women, visited about 100 schools, and distributed close to 100,000 uh, packets of sanitary pads, as well as underwear as well. So that's just some of the highlights uh, for the foundation. 
And it started to show me that people were giving me this label. They were saying, oh, you're in advocacy now. I said, I have no idea what you're saying. All I know is that I'm upset about something and I wanted to do, uh, to intervene. And I realized that it's that word that I think instills fear in us, because I truly think each of us in this room, everyone, which sounds a bit dramatic, but everyone in this world actually has a little bit of advocacy in them. I think the label is what throws people off. It feels like it's an exclusive club of NGOs and academics, and they just don't feel like they can contribute to larger issues. But take it from me, I had no idea that I would come from Frog Voice to founding a foundation that has intervened in a huge subject in Kenya. Um, and that's when I realized I needed to be intentional about it, read more about it, really throw myself in without the fear of the word advocate. But if you think about every one of you, you know, you're going to work or going to school, you're trying to do something to achieve change in your world or the world around you. That in itself shows that you're working towards a greater good. And that's why I'm saying all of us have it in us, but I think it's about acting on it and leaning in. So Goalkeepers was 2017. This was now when I was really shifting into saying I'm going to be full-blown bold about some of the work that I'm doing. It's a massive conference. It happens in New York around the UN General Assembly week. And that's when I started to realize this isn't an exclusive club. I was surrounded by people who threw a tweet or sharing something on WhatsApp or sharing a video on Facebook had founded programs and organizations that had changed the lives of 10,000, 100,000 people. It was that simple action because they were triggered. And I think it made me feel a little bit at peace about my own journey. Because the whole time I was thinking, once again, I'm a misfit, when here I was sitting next to a lady who was probably 23, and through one Facebook post, had been able to garner enough attention to help about 100,000 people who were struggling with poverty. And so that's what Goalkeeper did for me. It planted that seed. And it led to, later, me being the project lead for a program called Better for Kenya. And Better for Kenya, again, recruits influencers from different fields, whether you're a hip-hop artist, an athlete, you know, a lifestyle vlogger, and trying to create these platforms where they're able to use their voices and their channels to advocate and influence policy change and have conversations that are all geared towards gender equality. And this, once again, was around 2018 when I became project lead. And it was a little surreal to be put in charge of that, but I also realized this is cool because we're fellow misfits coming together in this club, but we're using our own voices and channels. And the response has been amazing because you have folks everywhere, whether it's students or people in corporate saying, oh, that's interesting. I've never really seen a hip-hop musician as somebody who would want to advocate for gender equality, but there we are. And then it landed on this project that I'm working on in 2019. One of the things that really speaks to me is storytelling. I love it. I know that it's something that a lot of people can relate to, and it's huge everywhere. And I feel like in order to really understand some of the issues that people face, it's through a story. It's putting a human face to something that seems too big or too daunting to deal with. And so I spent a few months collecting 50 different stories on people's first time interacting or having their period in order to demystify, destigmatize, and influence a change in the approach towards how menstruation is treated in this country, where women are shut out of the house for five days to go live with their livestock because they're too dirty to be in the home, or women are refused to go to a place of worship because they're too dirty. Girls have to solicit sex for pads 13, 14-year-old girls getting pregnant because of their period. And I thought, okay, let's start a conversation that demystifies and gets people clued in on just how disruptive period poverty is. And so I wanted it to be very inclusive. So a woman who's blind, we never really think about how she handles her period. A woman who's living with disability. An imam, so that we have male allies in the conversation as well. Um, a girl living with Down syndrome. A woman who's in her 80s, who's obviously way past that stage, but can reflect on what that did for her. And so it's a book which will be out hopefully in about 10 days or so, very soon, end of 2019. And the whole idea is to use it as well as a tool for fundraising and to influence policy change. 
It's also linked to a resource center, which I created as a safe space to have conversations. Now remember, my background is not in academia, or I'm not an expert in a lot of these issues. So I said, I want to be able to lean into something that works for me, that allows me to participate in change making. This resource center is the first one. It's in Kibera. It's just a room. And the whole idea is, because I'd spent a lot of time speaking to girls and women, realizing how disruptive periods were to them, I thought, would a safe space help you if you came and got the right information about your body, um, access to products? Is that something that would work? And they said yes. And it's fascinating to see how their eyes light up when they're able to get access to the right information. And that's linked as well to the book. And so your voice changes the world. I know it may look like I'm speaking from a point of privilege, like, oh, well, you were a news anchor, so you had the platform to go ahead and create this foundation. But remember Frog Voice. I never really thought I'd get there. But I leaned into kept leaning into this thing that was triggering me. And that's the biggest thing here, is I think every one of us is triggered by something. I mean, take like five or 10 seconds to think about it. Something triggers you. If you're angry about something, you're triggered. If you're sad, you're triggered. If you're frustrated, you're triggered. I think the next step is, what am I going to do now? And I think that's where we lose people, because they say, I have too much on my plate. I really don't need to be trying to change the world. But here's the sad truth. Silence is also a privilege. Can't really afford to be silent anymore, not in a world where we're allowed to express ourselves online and push for conversations. Sometimes it's a simple tweet. It's a Facebook post. It's a message. It's a WhatsApp message. It's sharing an article. Put it out there. You're participating by doing that. So here's some easy steps and ways that I think people can get involved, sort of like advocacy 101, if you will. Start small. I think that's the best thing to do. We get overwhelmed by trying to solve 1,000 things at once, but start small. Start with the one little low-hanging fruit. Is it in your home? Is it in your community? Is it in your child's school? Is it in the church? Is it in the mosque? Where is it? What is that thing that triggers you? What's the low-hanging fruit? And how can you interrogate it and try and push and say, okay, I want to learn more, and on top of that, I want to do something in my own little way, so start small. Highlighting an issue, again, if we're triggered, maybe do some research about it. Read a little bit, find out what people are doing in the space. Um, are we triggered by our bad roads? I know a lot of us are. Are we triggered by how things are being done in a certain school or somewhere near us? Highlight an issue, share it with your friends and your family over lunch, over Christmas, over New Year's. Um, write a letter to your government representative. A lot of the times we feel like these are things that don't go anywhere, but you're lending your voice. You're choosing not to be silent. You're triggered, and you're saying, I want to do something. And be authentic. The one thing that each of us has in this room is that we are all uniquely us. Nobody here is the same as anyone else, and therefore your perspective is also unique, and your perspective is needed because it also allows us to step out of what we think we know. So this is the quote that I feel carries me with all the work that I find myself doing, which is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And so I want you to ask yourself today, what triggers me? And I, probably a lot of you are already doing something. But if you're not and you feel exhausted, you feel like you have fatigue from all the things that trend that just completely bog us down, you feel like the news headlines are screaming at you and you feel helpless, if you're triggered, lean into that in your own little way. Because we need more allies. We need more voices. It's the little tiny voices that create something pretty incredible. And if I can be here, as a 14-year-old who was completely insecure about so many things and stand here and know that I'm going to put out a book that I feel is going to really change the way conversations I had in this country, then I think each of us, if we lean in to what triggers us, can really do something incredible. Thank you.